trick on you. Uh, it's a challenge talk. And I challenge you to remain awake. It's that kind of a talk. Now, sometimes they tell you when you're going to be a speaker that it's good to do something that people understand your very human qualities. And what I usually do is I make a confession of some sort. And the confession that I have to make is that I am a Rosicrucian fundamentalist. So what this talk is going to be is fundamentalism. It is about our work. And uh, most of the talk is introduction and nothing is exciting in it at all. <coughs> As above, so below. What has gone before in heaven will follow after on earth. Know this and rejoice. That is uh, a statement from a very ancient uh, teacher in Egypt called Hermes Trismegistes. Uh, Max Heindel, which means thrice-born Hermes. Not, not only is he a twice-born, he's a thrice-born. Uh, Max Heindel, in his writing, calls it the Hermetic Axiom. And other people call it the principle of analogy. Now, in the vertical pole of creation, the principle of analogy is how unity is maintained. Because from the deepest spiritual realms to more and more material realms, on each plane, things are analogous. And in that analogy is how the unity of the oneness of the universal spirit is maintained. So that's a very, very important thing to us. Now some of the ancient mystery schools, like the Orphic mystery schools of the Pythagoreans and especially the Platonists, they actually believe that this is how the universe was created. That by using the principle of analogy within the universal spirit differentiated each of the different planes. Uh, it was expressed in a book by an author from the Rosicrucian Fellowship called The Creative Word and Its Undertones. Uh, not, you know, like in music we use overtones, but actually it is the other way around in the, in the great cosmic creation. It starts out with the one word and then within that there are undertones and those become the basis for the different worlds. Everything in the divine plan, the scheme of the cre evolutionary creation, is analogous. For example, it's in our lives. In the first seven years of our lives, we recapitulate the Polarian Epoch. And in even earlier time, when we were mineral-like, if a little child hurts its body, its whole being has been challenged because it is in the mineral state. A little later on, in the second seven years, when the child grows very rapidly, that is a recapitulation of the Hyperborean uh, epoch. And a still earlier time in the sun period when we went through a plant-like existence. It's one of the worst things you can tell a child that age. If you don't eat your veggies, you're not going to grow. Because the identity of the child is in growing. And between 14 and 21, it is an analogous recapitulation of Lemuria and the earlier moon period. So everything in our lives is analogous to what we have done before and by all of the repeti repetitions on the grander and grander scales, uh, we, we awaken our consciousness. Even the second half of our life is analogous to the second half of the evolutionary creation. In the second half of our life, we look back more. And the more that we look back, the more our bodies go into disintegration and we take the soul stuff into our being so that we're much, much more soulful after we have looked back on our experience. 
So all of these things are analogous. Nadi is with great wisdom that the elder brothers of the Rosicrucian order made all of their exercises to be based on these same principles. So that when we awaken in the morning, the first thing that we do is we concentrate on the early verses of St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by it, and without it was not made anything that was made. In it was life, and the life was the light of ones. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So what we do in our exercise is we follow the word right into our daily life. And in the evening when we retire, we look at our, our day backwards. And we withdraw the essence of the day and carry it into our spiritual being. And we leave the body free and clear. So everything, even our exercises, are based on the same principles that are used in the cosmic creation. We learn that everything in the creation is spiral. And a spiral is a way that the analogous thing can be delineated through time. It's not just a circle where you go through the same circle again and again, but there's always a little bit of progress, and each loop of the circle is a little bit different, but there is something analogous. And this, there are spirals on other spirals until it is all within the one uh, individuality that, or the one spirit that creates it all. Now, we as students and probated, probated people of the Rosicrucian Fellowship are told to do things analogous to nature. We're taught that at the turning points, for example, at Christmas, which is the true New Year before they got the calendar screwed up, we're taught to look back at our year and to make resolutions for the New Year. The same thing at the vernal equinox and the summer solstice and the autumnal equinox. So every time there is an important point, that important point is a moment that determines the difference between the past and the future. So that we draw on the past and we resolve and carry things into the future with our spirit. Now we are at a very important turning point in the Rosicrucian Fellowship work. Our organization is now 100 years old. And we have been given a charge to carry the Rosicrucian work forward in the service of Christ. And that is, uh, that, that is our work. Now, when we look back at our lives at night, we don't do that in a nebulous way. We look at it according to very clear objectives. We didn't say, well, I just had a good day today or I had a bad day today. We say, was I loving to that person? Or did I really strive to do what I should do? So we are specific relative to aims, objectives, and purposes. And so, what we want to do as we're looking at this century turning point for the Rosicrucian Fellowship is we want to look at the aims, purposes, and activities of the Rosicrucian Fellowship to see whether we have done well or have not done well, and just to clarify in our mind what we're doing. Because it's very easy to get carried away into things that are our own thing. And there might be very good things, but if they are not what, what we have intended to do and what is most important to do, we're not doing the best that we can do. Now, the Rosicrucian Fellowship which emanated from the Rosicrucian Order, which is a completely inner organization, has very specific objectives. 
And so the purpose of this talk is in the simplest way possible, in the most fundamental way possible, to review some of what those objectives are. And if we are not in line with those objectives with our lives, to reattune ourselves, just like he tuned that instrument, so that we are reattuned to what we have, are supposed to do. And, you know, it, it, this is not something where we just do our own thing. Uh, Max Heindel, the founder of the Rosicrucian Fellowship, was very dedicated in that way. He could have taught all kinds of things, and he could have uh, given us all kinds of scientific knowledge and things like that, but he didn't do that. He worked off of the Bible verse, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all of this will be added unto you. So he didn't indulge himself in being that great proliferator. He did what was asked of him, and that was to teach the Rosicrucian philosophy, and he uh, did not put personal ambitions uh, in the way of doing that. Now, the Rosicrucian Fellowship, its official title is that it is an association of Christian mystics. Another name for the work of the Rosicrucian Fellowship is that it is a spiritual service organization. It follows the admonition of Christ, who would be greatest among you, be ye the servant of all. Now in both the definition and the statement of activity, the word Christ or Christian is used. The basic philosophy of the Rosicrucian Fellowship is Christian. It does not contradict biblical Christianity, and it is in agreement with most of the tenets of most of the denominations. But that said, the Rosicrucian philosophy does not exclusively rely upon the New Testament for its Christian basis. The claim is, is that those who are initiated and those who are the teachers of the Rosicrucian order from the inner worlds research with their own scientific spiritual observation and working under the commandment of, of Jesus or under the commandment of the cosmic Christ that all of the philosophy that they bring forth is a statement of reality about the nature of the cosmos from a Christian point of view. And the Christian point of view is very different. There are a lot of uh, philosophies that are like the Rosicrucian philosophies that go way back into history. But they do not have the attitudes that were brought to us by Christ. And this is something that we have to uh, uh, stress in all of this work. Now, I can't go into the whole Rosicrucian philosophy because that would be too much. So what I'm going to do is the very few things that I'm going to state are going to be stated in terms of biblical Christianity. So the basic statement or the basic commandment that comes from Christ Jesus in the Bible is the work is to preach the gospel and heal the sick. That is our work, to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. Now that's a very direct statement and it's, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to shirk doing that, but we seem to do it. Now, if we look at the New Testament of the Bible, uh, it's not a clear. It's clearly not an open book. There are parables that can be interpreted many different ways. There are stories. There are all kinds of things. It even says in there that some of the teaching was only for the disciples and not for the masses. That doesn't mean to be elitist, but it means to say that some people have prepared themselves more so that they can reach, reach and receive the teaching that comes straight from Christ. It says that there are mysteries, but it also says that the mysteries that have been from the foundation of the earth 
will be shouted from the rooftops. Now, I've got to be really careful here because Thomas knows the Bible almost by heart. I <laughs> if, I, if I misquote, just gently tell me later on where I am misquoting. Well, good so far. <laughs> I love that man so much. The first time I looked at him, I loved him. <laughs> Maybe going to give you a heart for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, there are statements from Christ that says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what does that mean? Does that mean at hand in time? That's what most people take it to mean. But the kingdom of heaven is at hand in space. Because it's closer than hands and feet. So that all of these things need interpretation. Now, if what we teach is correct, the ultimate authority is our experience. What we do not know and what we do not I have from direct experience, we always refer to Christ. And the only way that we can tell is the very way that the Bible tells us. By their fruits ye shall know them. And then it goes on to describe the fruits of love and all of the qualities that we as Christians are supposed to be. We are supposed to be people who love, not because we're supposed to love, but because we love. And that the love lives in us. And if Christ does not live in us, there's nothing much that we can really do. Now, what is the gospel that we're supposed to preach? Not necessarily preach, teach. That it's obviously that uh, what we are to teach is something that enlightens people, that helps them to live better lives, to help them to live in harmony with the cosmos in which we live, and that they can be receptive to the spirit of truth coming through them so that they can live and give to the creation as part of their life. So, our work is loving, self-forgetting service. It's very fundamentalistic. Loving, self-forgetting service. It means that we sacrifice our ego nature for the sake of the truth or something that we usually only hear as curse words for the Christ's sake. We sacrifice our ego, our selfhood. We give that over to Christ, which is the self of all selves. The self, you might say, the selfness of the universal spirit. And that is our work. This is what we are here to do. This, we're here to teach love. 19 years, 1900 years after the crucifixion of Christ, the elder brothers of the Rosicrucian order who had been spending hundreds and hundreds of years with their seership uh, investigating the spiritual worlds came uh, to a philosophy which was given to the world by uh, through Max Heindel. And this was given in accordance with the will of Christ. We have to trust them in saying that this philosophy is according to the will of Christ, but it doesn't contradict anything of, of Christianity, and it's filled with love and truth and all of those things, so taking it on trust, at least for me, is not a hard thing to do. Intuitively, I believe that teaching is something that we can, that we can uh, accept quite easily. Now, Let's look at some of the evidence to determine whether the Rosicrucian philosophy of Christ is, whether the Rosicrucian Christian philosophy is an extension of the gospel. 
and if it is something that is carrying out the work of Christ. The first is, has already been mentioned, and it must always be re-mentioned. We are in no way contradictory to biblical Christianity. And in all cases, it extends Christianity. We have a Bible course, and in that Bible course, explanations are given that open up a lot of passages of the Gospel that are very, very uh, opening. They're very, very, very pro-philosophical. They're, they're, they help us to live better lives because of their truth. Uh, I came to, when I came to the Rosicrucian philosophy, I was an atheist. And by studying the cosmo conception and then seeing Bible interpretations that made sense to me, that answered to my intuition and to my heart, I found that I could accept everything of Christianity that I couldn't take before from cookie Christianity. I called it cookie Christianity because I came out of, I was at a Methodist church, and being uh, of such a nature that I asked a lot of questions, every time I'd ask a, a question that wasn't within the accepted theology, they'd say, here's a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it answered all of those things, and there is nothing now about Christianity. I think that some of the churches make grave mistakes, and I think some of them uh, teach a doctrine that is anti-Christian, but nonetheless, I can be completely pro-Christian about all of the religions because I can see that in their own way, even though they inhibit things, they make the world a better place. And it is a positive, forward-going thing because of that. The whole idea of verification, uh, this is something that I find that myself and I think other people's of Ro uh, people of a Rosicrucian fellowship get wrong, is we become complacent and we accept too much. We read the Cosmo Conception, and the other works of Max Heindel, and we intuitively know the truth is in there. But we do not continue to question, and we do not continue to question our own knowledge of those things that we intuitively accept as true. If you look at the very first edi uh, edition of the Cosmo Conception, right on the title page, it quotes from the Bible. It says, Try all things. And this is the spirit that we should have. We should constantly try things. We should constantly test things because that is when they are brought to life. It is the, the philosophy of the Rosicrucian Fellowship cannot do us any good except if we can live it. We know the truth according to the way we live the truth. And in that we have the testament of both the Bible and of the cosmic conception. We, that's a good way to test our own progress. If we go back and read the Gospels, or if we go back and read the cosmic conception, and we find a passage and say, I never knew that was in there, that, you know, it's like it's a new book. Mm -hmm. The book is not new. We are new. And this is an example of the fact that we have grown spiritually. If we read it and it's the same old, same old, that means that we've become stale. We haven't tried to test this to see whether it really works. That was really a wonderful story you told me about bringing the heart into the class into the classroom because you tested it and you tried it and you put it to work and it worked. And that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So the most important thing for us is preaching the gospel and the question is, how do we do it? And the first way that we do it is we live our lives. Now what happens when we get involved with things like initiations and trials to become disciples and things like that, people read about these trials and they think it's all something artificial. Like you're going to get a test. And whether you pass that test, then they're going to give you something glorious. That's not the way it is. 
This is about reality. It's not a uh, dress rehearsal. This is the real thing. And w to the degree that we live it in our life, we bring up our own trials. What our character is, is reflected and fed back to us by the cosmos. This is what cause and consequence is. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And the way we deal with those trials is how we move forward. But really, it's not something apart from life. A trial is just an amplification of life. It is an amplification to see if we can live life in a more intense way. To see if we can live life on, on a higher and a better level. If we can't live it, we just go on, we just go on as we are. It doesn't mean any desired consequences, like we're going to be thrown in jail or rejected into a furnace or something like that. It just means that we live our same dumb old lives. I once applied for uh, discipleship. And it took me a half a year before I realized that that event that happened there was my trial. It was just, it was just part of life, you know. And again, is that what the... The things that are repeated by Christ in the, in the Gospels are the things that are most important. And one of the things that is repeated is, it cometh as a thief in the night. The spiritual life is not going to be only spectacular. It's not going to be like a fireworks demonstration. It is more and more subtle we become progressively more subtle so that we can see through. That's what clairvoyance means. It means seeing through, seeing clearly, so that we can see through the uh, denser and grosser things of life to the finer things behind. You cannot force your way. You cannot take heaven by storm. It is something that you develop the subtlety and... Uh, you uh, live your way into it by living a more subtle life. It should be that, it might be that uh, right within this room there are initiates, and we might not even know it because they don't go around and the name tag says, Hi, I'm the Richard, I'm an initiate. It isn't like that. It is by their life. Some people have the, the insights and they live them, in them, live them uh, out in the way that they live. Now, Max Heindel was chosen to be the messenger because he lived that kind of life. He lived a life with integrity. He lived a life of service. He gave it everything that he had. There is no substitute for character. A person can be intellectually brilliant, artistically creative, but if they do not have moral and spiritual character, they are not fit to be a teacher. In fact, when Max Seindel formed the Rosicrucian Fellowship, he was told only to associate with people of good character. Now, all of this brings up yet another distinction that needs to be made, and that is Max Seindel is something of an ideal to us, not the ideal that Christ is, but how do we serve our loving self or getting service? It doesn't necessarily mean that we're all going to be Max Heindels. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be great leaders or founders or anything like that. We're told very clearly that we serve or that we minister according to our own talents. We don't try to become somebody we aren't. We take what we are and we carry it forward and we make something better of it. And because we all have the spirit of the one universal spirit in us, we all eventually become gods. Now, in this process, there is no substitute for good, sound judgment. So if we are preaching the gospel, whether it be the cosmic conception or whether it be the biblical gospels, we have to realize that this is a creative art. Especially when we're dealing with people 
who are new to this. And somebody was saying, what is this? There are not many young and new people in the churches right now. It's all older people. Part of that is due to the fact that older people are more soulful because they suffered more in life and they've had their uh, rough edges uh, hammered off and the egoism is uh, very much humbled. But uh, part of it is, is that their people are going to come to Christ in a new way. I know people that almost know the Gospels by heart. I have one friend that read the St. John's Gospel once a day. But the Bible may not be the way of the future. If we look at the Bible and we look at it relative to what people know now with science, it's very anachronistic. And so if we take something like the Bible, or if we take something like the Rosicrucian Cosmic Conception, it is our duty to use good sound judgment to state it in words exactly it, that, that come from us and that are perfectly attuned to the person that we're talking to. There is biblical testament to that when, when St. Paul says to be many things to many people. We are the ones that are supposed to be more expanded people and we are the ones then that should be able to adapt ourselves and to be able to bring truth to other people in their own way. It's all about birds. We all are told that not to be parrots. And we just don't quote. People don't want to hear this quoting again and again. They want something live from people. So it's more like the birds that have little ones in the nest and they take, they go out and they get worms or bugs or whatever they do and they partially digest it. And then they feed the uh, little ones that way. And that's the way the Rosicrucian philosophy should be for us. We should digest it and unless we can say it in our own words without having to rely on technical terms, this is one of the things I do a lot with astrology. I teach a lot of astrology. And any time you're doing astrological work and you have to use an astrological technical term, you have failed. If you can't say what you have to say in English, and in English in a way that you can explain to someone, then, you, then, you're, then you're stuck in a technical jargon. And you're, you're not really uh, fully helping in that. All right. Knowledge. What we're talking about with the Rosicrucian philosophy, the Rosicrucian philosophy is not for everyone. I'd almost like to get everybody to say that. The Rosicrucian philosophy is not for everyone. It's for people who need explanations in order to follow their heart. It's for people who you might call it egghead Christianity. It's for people who are way too mental and are way too involved with technical scientific things and they're so far away that their heart is starving to death. And some of them can be pretty obnoxious people. I was pretty obnoxious. I was a vociferous atheist when I was an atheist. And uh, one person even said, well, where's your book for atheism? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is a symptom. If somebody is an obnoxious, vociferous atheist, uh, that's a symptom of the fact that their heart's starved, that they're looking for something more. And you know, the, you probably know, working with some of those kids, the ones that are the toughest ones are the ones that have the greatest emotional inner needs. And if you can get through all of that, and so this is what we need to do with the Rosicrucian philosophy or just sharing straight biblical Christianity is we need to be able to use good judgment. Sometimes we talk only about one simple thing and that's all that, that a lot of people need. 
Donald Lynch spent most of his life talking about one principle, the principle of cause and consequence, which he put in, uh, which he stated in a different way. Uh, but he just kept working at it until people got the idea for themselves, and when they got the idea for themselves, their lives were better. Most of all, when we're applying good judgment about how we teach, is we don't try to impress other people intellectually. Because that's almost like slugging them. You're just putting out words and principles and concepts. That's not what, that's not what Christianity is. Christianity is a religion of love. It is a religion of forgiveness. I have a hard time practicing it, but I try to practice it even on the highway. You know when, when the lanes are coming together in Upton Ridge? And these guys always come up uh, uh, when the lane they're not supposed to be in. And you say, I'm not going to let them in there. It's still a fight for me. But sometimes, you know, the inner, the still small voice tells me you got to let them in there. Because you're giving them a break even though they don't deserve a break. And that is what grace is. Yes. Grace is yes. when we got a cosmic break even though we didn't deserve it. We were sinful, selfish, very dark people and we're given light. It, we don't even, some people don't even accept it. So it, unless what we're teaching, you know, like you can teach nothing but cause and consequence and you can be a hard nose about it. That's not Christianity. Christ said, I came to fulfill the law. And Christ superseded the law. So that when we are preaching the gospel, which is the first of our objectives, uh, we do it with an attitude of Christ. If there are sophisticated arguers and they try to make a fool of you, so be it. It's, you know, it's no different than being sucker punched into, into a fist fight. Uh, to, because somebody does it intellectually, you have to love them no matter what. That leaves us only a few minutes to talk about the second thing that is our work, and that is to heal the sick. It's very important right now, and it is the way that humanity advances itself the most. In the Bible, Christ tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's a strange notion. If you take that in a small scale of time, that disrupts the whole idea of cause and consequence or action and reaction. But so you have to look at it in a deeper and a more far-reaching way. <coughs> and when you do, you see that during the whole first half of the evolutionary creation, it is a creation, it's not just an evolution which would be like a machine, it is the creation of the universal spirit. In that whole first half, when we were creatures, we were receivers. And we advanced ourselves by receiving the teaching that the angels and the archangels and all the other hierarchies were giving to us. Now that we have taken the creative force in our own hands, even though we jumped the gun in what is called the fall of humanity, now that we have taken that creative force into our own hands, we are now part of the creators. And for the whole second half of the creation, we are to be creators, which means givers. It is more important, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I believe that this is what Christ is pointing to when he made that statement. So like we are becoming creative beings. But that ignores the fact that we have this large burden of sin. And we have this great distorted character and personality from many, many past lives of sinning. And so... What the spirit is works its way out. Bad thoughts lead to bad desires. Bad desires lead to bad actions. And bad actions lead to sick bodies. So if we are to become creative beings, 
we, our first work in creation is regenerative. And by that is we use our creative abilities to uh, help others be uplifted. So when we, this is why healing the sick is put on the same level as preaching the gospel. In fact, they actually are both the same thing. But the Rosicrucian philosophy has a wonderful healing practice. It has a service that is designed to put us in touch with Christ and to draw on the healing energy of Christ and to bring it down to where it can be used here on this plane and shared with other people. Moreover, through the use of astrology and other things, we understand what is wrong in the character so that it's spiritual healing where we try to help people with their attitudes that have led to the conditions that they have and so the healing may not be a always be a dramatic laying on of hands it might be just bringing an understanding to someone that they need to change their life forever so when we heal the sick we study not with an idea to know things, but to know things that we can help people and that we can heal them. Now, in the Rosicrucian order, as we said in the Rosicrucian philosophy, as we said in the very beginning, we are taught to challenge. Because when we challenge, we learn the truth from experience. First-hand experience is very, very important in the Rosicrucian philosophy. And healing prayer is probably the best way to get first-hand experience. You know, you can sit and do, you know, you, you've all heard these stories of people, of fakirs in India, who sit and concentrate and they put a seed in the ground and you see the tree come up and you, you see the fruits come off of the tree. Well, Madhu Blavatsky, who was a deep student of uh, Eastern philosophy, said, those are the dropouts. She, she said, those are the people that only worked on concentration for psychic phenomena. They said, look at what I can do. And they got all fascinated with that. And they didn't use it for service. And so, if we want to develop our inward powers, especially the, the power of concentration, there is no better way to develop concentration than to do healing prayer. Because at the same time that you are developing your talents and your abilities, you're helping people. And you're helping people if you give it over to their free will and in accordance with Christ, you're helping people without sticking your nose in their business. And so... This is, I'm really strong about this. I've made several ventures in life. I've made some success in South America, not so much in North America, of getting people to do the healing service on a regular basis and forming core healing groups that are like teams that you work together and that you know because of each other that your prayers are stronger and that you can be much more effective. And I, I you know... As, as far as trying to grow as Christian mystics, I can't think of a better way than to participate in the healing work. It's practical, it's down to earth, and it's the best way to develop your talents. And that's about all I have to say, so we'll close with the Rosicrucian student's prayer. O oh God, increase our love for thee so that we may serve thee better from day to day. Let the words of our minds and the meditation of our hearts be accepted by thy sight, O Lord, and our strength, and our liberty. Thank you. I'm awake! <laughs>